welcome, Gordon. Thank you for joining me for the podcast today. I know there's many of our audience members are looking forward to hearing from you. And uh, we certainly do a bit of build up uh, around here's the new podcast coming and, and is your podcast uh, before it's, it's published. Uh, it'll be I know there will be lots of excitement around it. So thank you for joining me. Delighted. And so, Gord, I know the, we spent a fair bit of time together. I know a lot about you and your career path. But for the purposes of the audience, tell us a little bit about uh, Gord Giff and sort of who you are, where you grew up, uh, just a little bit about your, your, your life. In, in, in a, in a, I know there's, there's been a lot to it, but in a succinct fashion. <laughs> sure. Well, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Born in Massachusetts, and about uh, six weeks after I was born, my family moved us to Montreal. And I spent uh, through seventh grade growing up in Montreal okay. and, and then finished high school in Toronto. So I lived in both Montreal and Toronto in my pre-university days. Left Canada to go back to the United States for university and law school. Duke University in North Carolina, and then Emory University Law School in Atlanta. And right after law school, got an opportunity to work as a lawyer in the United States Senate for a young, then young U.S. Senator Sam Nunn, who had just been elected. Worked for him for six years in Washington and went back to Atlanta. Practiced law for, oh, 20 years or so. Uh, was involved in politics and public policy throughout that period. And in uh, 1997, was fortunate enough to be nominated and confirmed to be the United States Ambassador to Canada, returning back to where I had grown up. And uh, after four years there, returned back to the United States and resumed my law practice, which I've been involved in uh, since that time. And besides law practice and politics and government. I've been on several public company boards, uh, mainly large Canadian public companies. And Gord, there's, as uh, you were extremely succinct in all that you've accomplished, so the, it's, it's uh, I think it provides a great summary. And even I learn a lot every time I ask this question, because I didn't know about the time you had spent in Canada earlier in, in your life. So that actually ties it in nicely with the, the experience that followed later in life. Uh, and Gord, the I, I know that uh, certainly the that uh, typically when, as we grow up or as our career advances, we have sort of people that have had an influence in our lives. Who would you say have said the biggest influence in your life, whether personally or professionally? Uh, if you were well, I, I think if you exclude family my parents and my wife. Uh, if you exclude family, I'd have to say Sam Nunn, the United States Senator that I worked for uh, for six years in the U.S. Senate, but he has remained a close friend and mentor to this day. I spoke to him earlier this week. Uh, we spent a lot of time together. I'm going to Washington later this month to spend some time. We're working on a project where the U.S. Navy's naming a a military ship, a destroyer after Sam Nunn, and I'm working on that project with him. So I have to say he's been a significant factor in not just teaching me how to be a professional, uh, but showing me what integrity means and honesty and hard work. Uh, he's been a, a real role model for me. And that certainly would have been at a formative time in your career as well, Gord. So that makes a lot of sense and, and unsurprising. And uh, it's it's fortunate when we have leaders early on in our careers that we can learn a lot from because then it helps us mold who, who we can be. Um, and you're certainly well known in, in both U.S. and Canadian politics. And that, that's I'll, I'll touch I'll touch on that a little later uh, in, in our podcast. But uh, before we get into the professional side of things, uh, what do you do for fun? Yeah, you know, the, when, when you have such a demanding corporate life and, and uh, political life, is there time for hobbies? And what do, what do those look like? Well, you know, interestingly, when I was younger, uh, because I had my law practice, my family, and I was very involved in politics, uh, which took a lot of time when I wasn't with uh, my family or at the office working. Uh, 
there really wasn't much time to develop skills and things like golf. I've got a lot of friends that uh, are devoted to golf. I never took up golf because if I tried to fit in leaving the house for six hours or seven hours on Saturdays and Sundays to go play golf, I never would have been home. Uh, so I have to say at this stage of my life, uh, w what I do for fun is spend time with friends. We've been lucky that over the years, both in the United States and Canada, we've made a lot of friends and we really enjoy getting together with them. Uh, I enjoy boating. I have a boat here in Florida where I am right now, and I have a boat at our house in uh, Western North Carolina on a little lake. And I love to get out in the boat and just ride in the uh, sunshine and, and uh, enjoy being out in a boat. Uh, I enjoy walking and hiking. And we've really taken up traveling a lot in recent years because I spent so much time working in, in my younger days that uh, we never really took the time to travel. And there are lots of places of interest to us around the world that we want to see. So I'd, I'd say travel. And then the last thing I'll say is we still enjoy skiing. We go to Colorado every winter and, and uh, uh, we're fortunate that both my wife and I still are able to and enjoy ski. And Gord, if I, if I were to guess before I asked you that question, I was going to guess travel as part of it. Uh, I think, uh, partially, and having been fortunate, that he, some great travel experiences uh, all the way to the edges of the world. And I mean that literally with the most recent Antarctica trip. So. <laughs> and uh, so if we have time, let me ask you a bit more about that, because people may wonder, it's like, oh, what's that like? You know, how do you do a trip to, to, to Antarctica? But it's just... Uh, it's one of those one of those fun things that uh, very few people get to try, and I think it's uh, it's worthwhile talking about. Uh, so, Gord, let me uh, I'm going to sort of go back a bit to to the earlier stages of your career. So, getting the law degree, the what what sort of pushed you to think about the Senate and why why go there first, sort of early stages of the career? Was it a, a political aspiration? Was it something that you just found that interesting? Yeah, well, for some reason from my early years, and by that I mean six, seven, eight years old, I've always been fascinated by government and public policy and, and politics is sort of at the core of government and public policy. And, and I read as a young kid, all I did was read um, biographies of major historic figures uh, and primarily U.S. historic figures. Even though I was living in Canada, I was fascinated by uh, the history of the United States and, and major elected, uh, particularly elected leaders and some military leaders. And, and so that developed in my brain a, a interest in politics, government and public policy at an early age. When I went to Duke University, I majored in history and political science, and that gave more momentum to thinking about how public policy, government, politics affect our lives. And when you go to law school, that's about implementing laws that are made by elected officials. So I never had any particular aspiration to run for office or, being in, or be in an elective office myself but I was fascinated by the process. And it just turned out serendipity that um, one day there was a notice on the bulletin board at the law school that the newly elected U.S. Senator from Georgia, Sam Nunn, was creating an internship program in his office and was gonna start with one law student um, in that program. And I just almost as a lark because I'd never been in Georgia, had no relationships in Georgia. He certainly, I'd never met him, had no reason to believe I'd be selected, but I got lucky. I got selected uh, my third year of law school. So I went up there one quarter of my third year of law school and worked in his office as an intern. And I left and I came back and I finished law school. And actually I started practicing law for about four or five years. And he called me and asked me if I'd like to come back there and be his chief counsel and legislative director. And uh, so I 
turned my life around and went back to Washington. And it was a fabulous job for me. I mean, when I would drive to work in the morning and I'd park my car and I'd walk to the office and the U.S. Capitol was in front of me every day. And I just look up and literally almost every single day I'd look up and say, I can't believe I get to work here. So uh, that was a stimulating and formative part of my young career. No, oh, and, and it is, it is, uh, I, I can appreciate the, how majestic it looks, uh, Gord, as to, to any tourist that has seen it. I mean, going there every day, I can appreciate the fascination of it. Uh, and, you know, it's also, but a couple of takeaways, it's, you saw this posting at the law school, you pursued it. So uh, sort of takeaways for anyone younger listening to this uh, or in law school or otherwise, when you see those opportunities arise in any capacity, uh, pursue them. You never know what comes from them. And it's, it can completely change your career path, depending on some of those choices early on. Yeah, I'm very much a believer in uh, preparation meeting opportunity. And and uh, I obviously hadn't prepared to work in the Senate per se, but as I say, all my formative years, I'd been fascinated by that kind of process. Uh, and without knowing that I was preparing myself for it, I had. And when the opportunity presented itself, even though it seemed like a remarkable long shot, uh, I took a shot at it. Um, so I firmly believe that if you are, are really motivated to want to do something, don't don't uh, don't shy away from it. You know, jump in, even if the water's pretty cold, and uh, see see if you survive. Uh, and, and I had no anticipation that it would turn into a permanent job opportunity. That that just I mean, it turned out that Sam Nunn and I. He was only 33 years old. I was 23. I was 23. So I was lucky. He was a young man in the Senate. He wasn't one of the 60 or 70 year olds. So we related to each other and um, worked out well enough that he invited me back to be a permanent member of his senior staff. And Gordon, uh, certainly at the time, you may have not been as familiar with Georgia, but you're certainly much more familiar with it now. And uh... Oh, yeah. If you spend six, if you spend six years working for a senator elected from the state of Georgia, you 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 learn every detail, every nook and cranny of every part of the state, and that's why I decided to go back to Atlanta. To, it had never really been my home. I had gone to law school there, but I went back to Atlanta because I knew the state of Georgia so well, uh, and just decided that that's where I should practice law. No, and it's uh, it, like I said, it's funny how those things uh, work out. Uh, going from the northeast, uh, and then fascination with Georgia, and then uh, uh, it's uh, it is it is a fascinating story. Uh, and Gord, let me ask you from sort of the first few years of practice, and then going to to work in the Senate. Uh, so, w what was the path from there to ambassadorship afterwards? What triggered the ambassadorship uh, at a later stage? Well, as I said, I, after I got back to Atlanta, I um, developed a law practice that, among other things, included um, doing election law work. And I represented a number, as a lawyer, I represented a number of uh, candidates for public office, both in the state of Georgia and outside the state of Georgia. And I specialized uh, in something that there aren't a lot of lawyers handling. Now, that was just a very small part of my practice. It really doesn't pay the bills. I, I, I did a lot of what's known as administrative and regulatory law, primarily energy-based and telecommunications-based legal work. But by getting into the representing political figures and representing political campaigns, I got very involved with a number of, and I was quite particular about who I would represent. I had to really believe in the person before um, I got involved in that effort. And I got involved as a result in, in many political campaigns and became more and more, more involved, not just in the legal part of it, but the strategy and the policy and how do we win this sort of attitude. And with Sam Nunn, who I um, chaired his successive campaigns for the U.S. Senate, I got involved with young uh, 
candidates in the Democratic Party who were largely from the Southern United States, which led me to get to know and be very involved with a senator from Tennessee, Al Gore, and a governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton. And and became I've heard of that. yeah well and <laughs> and when I won't tell the whole story it takes too long but when President Clinton decided to run for president in 1992 he asked me if I would chair run his campaign in the state of Georgia for the primary and I asked Sam Nunn if because none had thought about running for president I wanted to make sure he wasn't going to do it and then I asked him and he said Bill Clinton's one of the most impressive thoughtful, bright, moderate, young politicians coming up. I, I think you should do it. So I chaired his campaign, not frankly thinking that he was necessarily going to be president because President George H.W. Bush at the time was very popular. So again, I got involved, but didn't know where it was going to go. And in 92, for a variety of reasons, Bill Clinton didn't do very well in the early primaries. He lost Iowa. He lost New Hampshire. He lost Maine and he lost Maryland. The next, the next primary was the state of Georgia, and uh, we had moved it up, changed the law to move Georgia earlier, uh, a week earlier than the so-called Super Tuesday, a large collection of states. And it turned out that we won the primary in Georgia, which basically saved his candidacy, kept him in the race, and history will show he went on to win the presidency from there. But on the night that we won that primary, in his eyes, I became very smart. Uh, <laughs> and he gave me a lot of credit for the effort and the strategy and the coalitions that permitted him to win the state of Georgia. And I never really tried to disabuse him of the fact that I was really a pretty talented guy. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and so it went on from there where he kept asking me to take on different responsibilities. And he asked me to uh, join his White House staff in the first term. But having worked in Washington for six years, I didn't want to move my family back to Washington for me to take a big job that would require 24 hours a day. And I'd never see them. And I'd have an exhilarating experience. And they'd have a lousy one. So I kept turning down working in the White House. But he kept assigning me projects that I worked on for him outside of government. Uh, and I know this is taking too long, but in- Oh, no, no, I, in, it's a fascinating story. I think our audience would love it. So in, please. In, in February of 95, he was invited by Prime Minister Krejcian to make a state visit to Canada. The President of the United States going to Canada for three days. And he called, the President called me and he said, you grew up in Canada. Your father was born in Canada, which he was. Um, he said, I'm going to do a state visit. Why don't you go with me? And so I went to Canada with him in February of 95, flew on Air Force One, um, went to the governor general's luncheon on, in honor of the president, went, sat on the floor of parliament when he addressed parliament as his guest and went to the state dinner that Mr. Krejcian, um, hosted in his honor and, when the president made his remarks at that state dinner in Ottawa, he pointed to me in the audience and said, I brought my friend Gordon Giffen up here because his life is a metaphor for how close our relationship is be between Canada and the United States. And he talked about me a little bit in his speech. And of course, nobody in the room, there were 600 people in the room, nobody knew who the heck I was. Uh, <laughs> And on the plane on the way back, on Air Force One on the way back, the next morning he came back and sat next to me on Air Force One, which, by the way, is a thrill in and of itself. Just I, I can imagine. <laughs> the, the most remarkable airplane in the world. Uh, and, and he said, how'd you enjoy the trip? And I was quite emotional. I mean, it meant a lot to me, having lived there, my family on my father's side, having been from Canada. And he looked at me and he said, well, maybe one of these days you ought to go back there as our ambassador, which I had never thought about and that had never occurred to me. And I guess I must have looked startled and perhaps interested. And he looked at me, this was 95, and he said, you've got a lot to do 
in my reelection campaign. You're going nowhere until after I get reelected. <laughs> but he was certainly a visionary to say the least. So, <laughs> so I worked hard in his reelection campaign. I ran the south, south, the southern region of the country in his reelection campaign, and at a reception the night before his second inauguration in the White House, we're standing in the White House. It was a pretty small reception. There were my wife and daughter and I'd say maybe a hundred people. And he came over to me and put his arm around me and he said, well, what are you going to do in my second administration? And I looked at him and I said, you don't remember, but I do, that 18 months ago you said, why don't you go back as our ambassador to Canada? And I said, if you'll make me ambassador to Canada, I'll go. Oh, oh wow. What a... That is a fascinating story, Gordon. And uh, again, I knew the, the broad strokes, but not not the details of how it transpired. And I mean, it all makes sense because if you think about like the the relation between U.S. and Canada, it's so important that uh, any president would want to have somebody really trusted that also knows the, the dynamics of the nations, etc. So that is that is a fascinating story. So I'm. I'm uh, I'm going to go back to, to that flight on, on Air Force One. It's, it's, uh, that is fascinating in, in itself, and uh, that would be something that very few people have experienced, I would imagine. So that, that is, uh, I can appreciate why it's the, the most famous plane in the world. Yeah, it's something else. When he'd come visit Canada, I keep having to touch my screen here to take things off, but when he'd visit Canada for different events, I would ask people, for example, in Ottawa when he came to visit uh, if they would like a tour of Air Force One or if they'd want to go to one of the fancy parties. And I have to say, many people chose a tour of the airplane over going to a fancy party. I, I would have, I think I would have chosen the same, Gordon. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is, because, it, it, you know, you, you get a chance to go to fancy parties, but you don't get a chance to tour Air Force One very often. So. No, that's right. And it's worth it, believe me. Uh, and... So again, now this was a new challenge in your life, and you had obviously done a lot with the president. So there was trust built there. You had uh, experience in Washington. You knew how to navigate Washington. But at the same time, and you had dealt with elections, etc. So very familiar with a lot of the political issues. But now you had to get a bit more familiar with Canadian issues. I imagine that then you would have probably up until that point. What was that transition like? What were some of the challenges? that you can talk about uh, sort of sure. well first before in in terms of current then current issues you spend a heck of a lot of time once you're nominated by the president in our system you still have to be confirmed by the United States Senate so before my confirmation hearing you prepare for something like that as if it's a final exam for your doctorate uh, because you're going to have senators quizzing you, some of whom are um, supportive of your nomination, some of whom are trying to trip you up and make it look like you're not qualified. So you, you prepare for that in a pretty intensive and serious way. And the State Department does a lot of work uh, preparing you as well. And you have a two-week crash course. I call it Ambassador 101, where they teach you and your spouse what it's like to be an ambassador, what the responsibilities are, what the legal uh, issues are, all of the things associated with being an ambassador. So you prepare in a very intense way uh, prior to going. All that said, I grew up in Canada. I studied Canadian history. I studied Canadian geography. I traveled the country as a young man. The press, when I first got to Canada, said, well, your predecessor, Jim Blanchard, governor of Michigan, who preceded me, took a trip across Canada on the train when he first got here in order to become familiar with the country. Are you going to do that? And my answer was, I took that train trip when I was seven years old. Right. Um, I, I, when I was in Western Canada, I knew more about Eastern Canada than the people in Western Canada did because I grew up in Quebec and Ontario. And... Uh, so I had the grounding having grown up there. I didn't just read about Canada. I lived Canada. I, I knew the different dynamic in Quebec than in Ontario. Um, 
And it's pretty easy to get caught up on whatever the issue of the day is. If you, again, understand history, if you understand how it got there, and if you understand the government and political process, you know, how, how things got there and what the levers are that might fix them. And, and so my grounding in, in everything I had done before I came um, prepared me very well for the job. And I love people and I enjoy getting to know people. And I actually think I have a skill of being able to listen to people. A lot of people in important public office spend too much time talking and not enough time listening. And I find that the listening skill is one that you have to develop and then deploy. Um, So I was just lucky it all came together and it was uh, a job that I was honored to have. And I guess the last thing I'll say is for a U.S. ambassador, it's awfully important for the host government, in this case, the Canadian government, to believe that you have access to the boss, being the president of the United States. And and if you do not, then they don't think you can effectively do your job representing their interests, if you will. If it appears that you do have access, then you have immediate credibility with that government. And I had all of the markings of somebody who had access to the boss. And more importantly for me, and I'm going on too long, but the network of friends that I developed over the 25 years that I was involved in government politics before I went to Canada, almost all of those friends that I developed who were my peers, my age, were now working in Washington in the Clinton administration. So if I needed to do something at the State Department, the Energy Department, the Defense Department, I wasn't calling just as some titled official ambassador. I could call one of my pals who was at the the senior level in any one of those departments uh, and have a conversation that was more friend to friend than it was official to official. And that makes things a heck of a lot more fluid to get things done. Well, and, and Gord, we've seen that time after time in this podcast with the various business leaders where the, the value of the network and the social capital, that what that means. And certainly as being ambassador, you would have, a lot of these officials would have probably taken a meeting with you, but it would have taken a while longer to get to an outcome than when there was a really pretty existing relationship and credibility built in. So this, and, and the reason, what makes this story fascinating, one is it's unique for the podcast because we, we don't, sort of the, your profile isn't very common. <laughs> and sort of understanding this, uh, uh, the level of understanding, uh, although it's unsurprising, it's really interesting to understand how these dynamics develop and, and how they work. Yeah, the one thing that I have to say, and you probably wouldn't have asked this question, so I'm going to answer it anyway. Please. That, that, the most surprising thing to me about being U.S. ambassador to Canada was not that you're an advocate for the United States in Canada, but how much time I had to spend educating my own government, in effect being an advocate for Canada in the United States, because sometimes there wasn't an understanding in Washington of the need to do something or not do something related to Canada uh, and I'd have to intervene in Washington and in effect be an advocate for the Canadian interest because I believed that outcome was in the best interests of both countries. And so um, Prime Minister Krejcian asked me when I was leaving, actually, as ambassador, he asked me what the most surprising thing was. And I said, the most surprising thing is I spent more time trying to help you out than I did help Bill Clinton. Uh, <laughs> and... And uh, it's really true. If you're really doing your job, you have to. Everybody in Washington thinks they're the smartest people on the planet. And and oftentimes they don't stop to try and understand the dynamics in a allied friendly country before they make a decision. It was my job to make sure they understood. 
Well, and, and some of those decisions can can have such broad implications economically, politically, that that advocacy is so important. You it, it, you can't even sort of quantify the the value monetary, monetarily or otherwise, right? It's um, and it, it it makes me wonder uh, sometimes the there's obviously a fair bit of proximity geographic and and certainly historical between the U.S. and Canada. But imagine as we have ambassadorships in other countries as well, where where the line of sight may not be the same way. It's it's, it's even more work to try to uh, to understand those dynamics uh, that, that that you you understood a lot more naturally. Yeah, and because of Canada's proximity to the United States, Canadians are, I think, inordinately focused on what's going on in the United States, and they take things personally if the United States does something that is not considerate of Canada and Canadians. When that decision was made based on something going on elsewhere in the world, it really wasn't intended to offend or affect Canada. But Canadians, as you know, spend a lot of time watching U.S. TV, paying attention to... I mean, there are times when there are elections going on in both countries and Canadians are paying more attention to what the elections going on in the United States. So you have to, it's a, it's a full time, 24 hour a day job where if you were in France or Austria, not so much because they're not focused on the U S as much as Canadians are. I can, uh, I can appreciate all those dynamics and, uh, why it's so ever, uh, why it's so involving and and so demanding time wise, uh, and so again the the four years flew by pretty quickly I'm sure because it's it's uh, the time when especially at that speed is is uh, ever uh, it's almost like on fast forward and and, and things are get evolving by the second. What are what are some of the things you would say um, if. Uh, an aspiring or future ambassador is listening to us, uh, or, or, or sort of key takeaways. What would you, what would you advise to somebody? Well, well it's, a, it's not a career path that's e- easily defined. As for sure, for my, sure. My, mine was, as I said earlier, mine was rather um, happenstance that it all played out that way. But I, I think I'd say there are two paths. One is. And I encourage young people today, if they ask me, if they've got an interest in the world and, they've, and, and, and they're global in their perspective, they say, what would, what would you do? Would you go to law school? What would you do? And my answer is I would prepare to join the Foreign Service. I, I, I would prepare to go to work for the State Department as a profession. And you can do that after law school. You can do it after being in graduate school in English or in history or in political science or in geography. As long as your intellectual um, interest goes to the world, other countries, how we interrelate, if you read things and are interested in that, when you pick up the New York Times, do you only read the domestic news or do you read the international news? And if the international news interests you and if other countries interest you, then go into the Foreign Service because the Foreign Service in the United States is made up of extraordinarily talented people, very intelligent, very highly motivated people who are interested in the world. It's not like a job at the transportation department where a lot of people went to work there just because they needed a job. They they weren't intrigued by highways uh, or, you know, the FAA, but that's not true of the Foreign Service. They went to work at the State Department because they're intrigued by the world and international dynamics. So I think that's a fabulous career path that people are interested in. And it's rigorous, and you have to pass serious exams just to get in the door. Um, that's one path. And the other path is more unconventional, like, like I did. And, and people ask me about that. And I say, well, you've got to be interested in my view in being involved in the process. Uh, 
you, you have got to demonstrate that you have the diligence, um, the, the loyalty to a cause, the loyalty to inspirational people uh, to try and affect political outcomes. And if you get involved and ultimately become involved at the highest levels, then it may be available to you because in our system, a third of our ambassadors at any given time are what is called political appointees. They aren't career foreign service officers. Two thirds are foreign service officers. So you can get there by not being a foreign service officer, but you got to get the attention of not necessarily the president, but somebody right at the top who says this person would be a good selection. So those are the only two paths that I know in our system uh, to get to be an ambassador. And, and it's very similar to Canada, Gord. I think that advice would apply very similarly to, to either nation in terms of career path. And yeah, I think that's right. Although in Canada, the, the, the number of what I'll call politically appointed ambassadors is dramatically smaller. Uh, you oftentimes, and certainly in recent years, have a politically appointed ambassador in Washington. Uh, that's not the case today. Kirsten Hillman um, is, is a career uh, foreign service uh, officer, actually a trade specialist, uh, and she's doing a fabulous job. Uh, but the la before her would have been several political figures. Gary Doerr, who was premier of Manitoba, Frank McKenna, who was premier of New Brunswick, on and on. Um, and you've got a politically appointed ambassador in London, and I think one in um, Berlin and one in, in, in uh, uh, Paris. But you don't have many of them. So in Canada, the political path is less uh, successful. No, I, I can I can definitely appreciate that, <laughs> and and Gord, really, these are very fascinating because, like I said, it's it's been unique in in uh, within the context of the podcast, and but I will ask you a question that is probably a bit more common in our context, which is leadership lessons. So, if you were to share one or two leadership lessons uh, over time, uh, so not necessarily from the political realm, uh, it could be political or business. Or what would you share as as like a key learning of, of leadership in, from your career? Yeah, I have two thoughts about that because when I took my job in the Senate office, I had no experience really as a leader. Uh, I had been a student and as a lawyer, you're not trained to lead, you're trained to think and act almost independently. Um, and so I got a little bit of on the job training because I wasn't doing a great job for a while at this. And two things I would say, and, and they proved true throughout the rest of my life. Uh, one is you have to lead by example. If you're not demonstrating that you'll work 24 hours a day, if you're not demonstrating that you have principles and integrity and character, if you're, if you're not demonstrating loyalty to the ultimate cause in the Senate, it was uh, the work that one United States senator was doing, um, then the people who are working for you or responsible reporting to you are going to feel like they don't have to work that hard. Why should they work that hard? You're not. Why should they bring integrity to every question? Uh, why should they bring loyalty and, and, and focus and diligence if you don't? So I think, you know, lazy, dishonest uh, people can't lead. Uh, and so you got to be at the other extreme. And the second, that part's easy. Actually, leading by example is easy. The second part is harder, and that's accountability. You have to hold people accountable for what they're supposed to do. Not in a mean way, not in an overbearing way, not in a punitive way. But again, unless people feel like there's accountability, if old Joe over there is getting away with not working very hard and you're expecting me to work hard, what, 
why is that the case? And at least when I was young, I had trouble holding people accountable. That was hard. It was hard to sell somebody they weren't doing a job. And particularly much of my career, early career, I was much younger than many of the people who were working for me. So it's even harder to go to somebody who's older and in some ways more experienced and say, you're not doing it right. So those are the two principles that I would start with. Lead by example and hold people accountable. Well, and accountability is so key, Gordon, and, and uh, it it's, makes me sort of leads me to another question that would have been critical to your career later on, uh, post ambassadorship. So you've been on the board on the boards of many public companies and even private companies. Uh, so w- what are some key takeaways and learnings you'd say uh, from from being on these public boards that that you could share? Well, uh, in many ways the the approach in my mind is similar to many of the things that I've said. First, start off by listening. Just because you're a former U.S. ambassador and you walk into a boardroom doesn't mean you know how that place works, doesn't mean you know the dynamics of the board or senior leadership. You may even not know that much about the company. So you better spend the first period of time listening. Um, but you do have to bring one of the most important words in the in vocabulary to me is integrity, intellectual integrity, personal integrity. Uh, you have to bring integrity to it. You can't be just you can't be promoting your own self. You can't be wanting to just be heard, uh, just talk all the time. Um, so you have to bring integrity to the way you're doing your job. And and I, I won't go on and on, but the last thing I'll say in answer to this question is speak on subjects that you have something to contribute on. You don't need to be heard on every question that comes up. But you have an obligation to be heard on questions where you have a particular insight, particular set of experiences, and don't shy away from it. But I look at a board of directors. I've been chair of one company. I'm lead director of another large company. I look at a board of directors almost like a hockey team. Everybody's supposed to play a position, and they're not all supposed to play the same position. So I don't want to hear from everybody on the same subject. I want to hear from the left winger on this subject. You know, I want to hear from the goalie on this subject. I don't want to have a left winger telling me what a goalie ought to be doing. So play your position. Be heard on things that you know something about. And otherwise, just sit there. (laughs) (laughs) Otherwise, uh, remain quiet. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I can appreciate that, Gordon, and, and certainly uh, the, the accountability principle you mentioned earlier about leadership broadly would also apply to boards very similarly, I would imagine, just because the, the to some extent the management team uh, is accountable to the board and, and the accountability of, of the, the, the actual management team is, is and, and those same principles can, would be applied in that, in that category as well. That's right, and you have to hold board members accountable. But today, because there have been instances where boards don't self-police properly, we have all of these, what I call, do-gooder groups that are imposing extraneous rules on boards. Um, Term limits, um, age limits, things of that nature. And it's partially because they don't think a board will self-police that if somebody has been there too long, they're no longer doing an effective job that a board uh, chairman or lead director will go to that person and say, I think it's time for you to retire. Uh, And it's because of the failure of some leadership at, at corporate board levels that we're getting some of these um, rules developed and, I regret that because I think boards should handle their own 
self-policing in a sense and and renewal is part of that yeah some people have to leave in order to bring fresh perspective to a board but if you get rid of everybody who's experienced and knows the company and knows the history and and bring all new people in that's a mistake too so it takes balance well and you lose all the institutional memory uh, that's right if there's a purging uh, in that sense and then you're like okay you you may make some of the same mistakes that have happened historically unless there's a staggering of, of roles but that's that's a, a much bigger discussion that <laughs> that is very very timely as well well there's a historic statement in the united states that those who ignore history are destined to repeat it it's true about you know corporate institutional memory if you don't understand how you got here you may make a mistake about how you go forward for sure for sure when and gord as i suspected i had i have a, a lot of questions for you that i think we're going to have to do a part two to this podcast ah. uh, and I'll move us to, to a, 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 a bit of a lighter part of it, which we call the rapid fire questions. So these are one word answers. So it's first thing that comes to mind as I'm asking them. It's supposed to be fun and lighthearted. Sure. And the first question is, what is your favorite word? Well, that's easy. Integrity. Integrity. I love it. What word do you hate? Robust. Robust. <laughs> well, today everybody says we have a robust plan or robust this or robust that. Every time somebody says that word around me, I look at him and say, what the hell does that mean? Yeah. You know, <laughs> relative to what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you listen, that word is way overused. So I hate the word. <laughs> um, what word do you have a time? Do you have a hard time pronouncing, if any? Yeah, there's one, and it's peculiar to my history, and that word is plenty potentiary. Okay, well, that'll in, be a hard part for anybody. In, 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 in the title of a United States ambassador, you are titled to be an ambassador extraordinary and plenty potentiary. And plenty potentiary is supposed to mean you have the expanse of authority and powers of the president of the United States in the country to which you're assigned. And it took me forever to get to the point that I could say that word. I, I can appreciate that. <laughs> that would be, like I said, I think most people would struggle with that word. Uh, and Gord, um, what word, what is your favorite word in another language, if any? That's easy. Amour. Amour, ah. Uh. Can't go wrong with that. <laughs> it's one, it's and, one of the it's one of the world's most beautiful words. And uh, or do you speak any other languages? Well, uh, yes, I'm, I'm, um, I have been what I'll call functional in French. I'm not fluent in French. Excellent. I, I used French a fair amount while I was in Canada as ambassador, and I, I had a tutor. Uh, every week, once a week while I was in the embassy. And, and so, uh, so I appreciate your business, uh, Gary, of, of, of doing translations. I'm not, cl I still need from time to time translations, even English and French. No, I, I'm with you, Gord. Sometimes uh, the, it's, well, certainly with a multitude of language we have to deal with these days, it becomes a necessity. Uh, and then, Gord, my last one word question, uh, what's one word to describe yourself? Inquisitive, and I I would agree with that, uh, Gord. So that that all that all aligns. <laughs> yeah. No, and and it's uh, Gord. I uh, I really appreciate your time today. I think this has been an excellent podcast. And like I said, I, I didn't even get through half my questions, which just means we have to do another one, and uh, we just do it as part two. Well, it it, it indicates that I'm long winded in my answers. Well, I just was just fascinated by the story. And, and like I said, although we've had many opportunities to speak in the past, you, I learn every time. And, and just the sort of the evolution of the political career was fascinating. And I think for anyone listening, it's uh, uh, the proximity to, to the former president, et cetera. Those are things that very few people have had the opportunity to, 
to I've do. I've been I've right. been very fortunate throughout my career, and I've worked most recently very closely. I've been on the board of trustees of the Carter Center with President Carter and Rosalind Carter, and unfortunately, I was honored to attend Rosalind Carter's funeral recently. And I, I regret to say that I anticipate we'll have to do the same with President Carter in the foreseeable future. But I've been very fortunate working with them as well. Uh, and, uh, and like I said, it's a very unique profile for the purpose of the podcast, and it's been fascinating. And Gord, thank you again for your time. Delighted. I look forward to our to our uh, uh, our number our part two of this podcast. <laughs>